Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Santonetti, and we are here today to share the Word of God. We've been teaching from yesterday, and this is a two-part series, hopefully. <laughs> Please don't forget. It's like, Lord, what do you want to tell me? Please don't forget. Well, what is it that you don't want me to forget? Don't forget me. Remember me. Isn't that a beautiful thing? God's name, if you pray, you know, um, there's been a few times that I pray and I say, in the name of the same yesterday, today, and forever, and people say, you mean in the name of Jesus? I go, well, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say, in the name of Kwana, and they go, uh, what does that mean? The jealous God. Jesus said that God is our God, but God said that he was a jealous God, and he said, my name is jealous. Mm -hmm. So, in Zechariah 14, 9, we see another name revealed, and it says, Yahweh will be king over all the earth, and that day Yahweh will be one, and his name is one, Ikad. You know, when you look at the Hebrew word Ikad, it, it sums up to the number 13, and you know, um, I'm speaking to my wife too, you know, Rafina, that <laughs> we've often heard that the number 13 is bad luck. Yeah. That is not true. People have made it like that. But actually, the, the number 13 represents one. Now, why would God say he's bad luck? But actually, he was teaching us something that one is representative of the name Yahweh. In the sense, because 13 and 13 is 26, and 26 is the number of Yahweh. Wow. Hmm. See, when we study, we find amazing things. We've been talking about prayer, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, or our God, is one. <laughs> well, here the word one, or the, the, it's actually the name. He said, the Lord is Ikad. Now, the word Ikad actually represents unity. It represents the wall, a picture of a wall, and the picture of a door. Isn't that beautiful? Ikad represents one wall and one door, and that door is the entrance into the blessings of God's name. But remember that the wall separates the outside from the inside. In other words, God says, if you walk through this door, you're entering into me, my name. Outside, there is nothing. As a matter of fact, you know what, you know what Jesus said outside the gate was? Dogs. Mm. <laughs> Gnashing of teeth. But when we enter into Yahweh, we enter into the blessing. And he says, hear, O Israel. Now, the word here is the word Shema. And that's what we've been talking about, Shema. And this is interesting because the letters of Shema, we spell it S-E-M-A, but it's actually S, excuse me, we spell it S-H-E-M-A, but it's S-H-A-M-A. So, but Shema is interesting because there are three letters that represent this. We've been talking about prayer, and the three letters have pictures. Let me just give you the picture. A picture of teeth, water, and an eye. How about that? Teeth, which can consume, but it's the shin, which represents shalom, or shaday, which represents God is more than enough, and his peace is given to us. Everything outside of that will consume you. But he says shema. The next letter is the mem, which represents water, and we know that water is life. As a matter of fact, the Bible, the Bible tells us that that. The earth is full of water. As a matter of fact, they say that water is the blood of the earth. But then we have what is called the ayim, and it represents an eye. So here we have the peace of God. We have the God that is more than enough, that flows like water, and he sees all things. So the Shema, when he said, hear, O Israel, he said, listen to me. Pay attention. Respond in obedience to this. Now watch it. It also represents breath. So now, he's, he said something about prayer, the Shema, which the Jews pray every morning. 
every night and throughout the day. And we're talking about the tassels on the garment. We talked about that yesterday. So please go back and look at the, you know, the, uh, the episode from yesterday. And you know why we're doing these slide presentations? So that you can actually go back and stop and look at them and reread them. So it's a study. But now let's talk about where we left off yesterday in Numbers. And it tells us this. It tells us, Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and tell them that they should make themselves fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put on the fringes on each border a cord of blue. Remember that word, a cord of blue. And it shall be to you a fringe that you may look on it. You hear that? Look on the blue thread and remember all Yahweh's commandments. A blue thread, look at it and remember all his commandments and do them and that you don't follow your own heart and your own eyes after which you used to play the prostitute. Now, I want you to notice, we're going to go on, but I want you to notice what he said. Make sure that you put a blue thread, you look at it, and remember all the commandments and do them. Don't follow your own heart because, or your own eyes because that leads you to prostitution. Yes. Now, we talked about, we said, but wait a minute, I, I, I'm not a prostitute. It's not about that. It's about the fact that if you follow your own heart, and your own eyes, you will wind up selling yourself as a prostitute sells herself. Now watch this. So that you may remember and do all my commands, be holy to your God. And be holy to your God. I am Yahweh, your God. This is Yahweh Elohim, who brought you out out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Yahweh, your God. Now, folks, that is tremendous. When you look at the high priest's um, garment, God spent a lot of time, let me just put it that way, to give it to Moses. And Moses had to build all the pieces of the tabernacle as well as the clothing of the priests. And it had to be very specific and if you look at the bottom of the robe, you'll see that there are bells there. There's a fringe. There's a hem. Those, tass those, those bells represent the tassels. And the bells are interesting because the bells would ring whenever the high priest walked. And once a year, when he went into the Holy of Holies to put blood on the mercy seat, those bells would ring and... Tradition says that if they didn't hear the bells ring, because the high priest had to also first make a sacrifice for himself before he entered into the Holy of Holies to make an atonement for Israel. If they didn't hear the bells ring, they say traditionally they used to tie a rope to the ankle of the priest. Because if they didn't hear it ring, they knew that he was dead and they would have to pull him out because you couldn't go in there to get him out. Now think about this. The Bible also tells us in Psalms, it says, blessed are the people who hear the joyful noise. This joyful noise was the ringing of the bells within the holy of place. And it had to be very quiet outside. Very quiet outside. Because while he was in there, he was interceding. He was praying for Israel and putting the blood of the sacrifice upon the mercy seat. And these two wings, it's interesting, in between these two wings, the glory of God would appear and he would speak right into the heart of the high priest. Why is the Shema so important? Because it's supposed to represent God speaking to us and we speaking to him. It is the most solemn time when we speak to God in the morning, when we speak to him throughout the day, when we speak to him in our beds. It is a solemn time. Now, the reason that God told him to make a prayer shawl also was because when you put this prayer shawl on, you're closing out everything from the world. Now, I was talking to my wife, and we, we talked about people, the way we pray today. You know, we have our iPads and all this other stuff. They didn't have iPads. They didn't have an electronics. And, the, and this is interesting, that they had 
real scrolls. They had think the uh, scrolls that you touched, that you read, because they didn't want any any distraction whatsoever. And God even told Moses, "When you are up here in the mountain with me, you are to cut off everything. If anything touches that mountain while you are up here with me, it is to be put to death." All right. Well, when we look at the word uh, for you know the prayer show to leave. We see the tassels. Now, what does the tassels represent? They represent a floral or a wing-like protection. That is like a lock of hair. It was called a tassel or fringe. Now, these three, these four letters that you see here, notice that two of them are the same. The first and the middle one is the same. But it represents, very quickly, those. the first one and the middle one represents righteousness. You notice it looks like someone that bowing down with their hands turned but notice that it's turned when you look at it it's turned to the right to the right the letter that's before that is the word fe and it means to speak <laughs> okay the letter that's after that is interesting because it represents holiness or the head of holiness now watch this we have righteousness a mighty hand righteousness and then the last letter is the tau which represents truth or the word of god it is a protection so the righteous one, the eternal mighty hand, and a fence of protection or the fence of truth for protection. Now, let's talk about the tassels because the tassels represent something that bloom. We know that when you pray, things happen and things bloom inside of you. But remember, when you're praying, you're praying the Shema, but you're also quoting the verses of Scripture. Now, it represents a mother bird that hides her young in the wings to gather. But... The whole picture here is that when you put the, when he told him to put the the the, uh, the tassels or the fringes around the garment, it was to be as something that you gather yourself to prayer. You come close to gather yourself to God to talk to God. Now, he told them to put on to put the fringe on each border a cord of blue. That's what we read. That's what we read. And that cord of blue would represent the law of God. And that string would represent the laws and the principles of God's word. But it was for a binding, and we're going to look at that, okay? Now, the talith are specially knotted. The talith, that's the prayer, and the, and the strings, they were carefully knotted. And the ritual fringes on the tassels that, that were worn was by antiquity by the Israelites, and today... They still observe this, and I want you to just take a look at this, and we're not going to get very deep into this because it's a lot of stuff, but this is more or less what it looks like. It looks like this. This is what they do. And notice that they are they're white, and then there are twistings of or the turning or binding together with that blue thread represents something because we know that white represents righteousness, but watch this. But the blue represents the law, and it teaches us that God's word is pure. God's word is uh, undefiled. And the blue represents God because God is the God of heaven. That when we come to do the Shema, you were to pray to the God of heaven and you were to, watch this, keep in regard that he is holy, most holy, and his word is equal to his character, who he is, his attributes, righteousness, justice, truth. Now, tradition tells us that you know, the tradition prescribes the exact manner in which each tassel shall be made and gives a symbolic meaning to the numbers of windings and knots that you just saw. So in other words, the long cord is wrapped around seven shorter cords, okay? Wrapped around seven shorter cords first seven times, then eight, then 11, and finally 13. Remember we talked about 13. And watch this. What was interesting well, we're going to see that the number seven and eight constituting 15 together suggests Yah. This is half of the name of Yahweh, Yahweh and the number 11, excuse me, represents We. So together they represent the name of God, Yahweh. And they were to be, they were to remember, we saw that they were 15 and the 11, okay, which represents 26, 13 and 13. 15 and 11, okay, represents 26. They were to be separated. In other words, that the law and God are one, and that one represents Yahweh. 
Okay. I want to show you something about Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, that I, I put this verse of scripture into memory a long time ago, and it came to mind as I was studying this. And, you know, Epaphras, Paul said, who is one of your own, a slave of Messiah, meaning that he was a servant of Messiah, Yeshua, greets you. He is always laboring or wrestling in prayer on your behalf so you may stand complete and fully assured about everything that God, uh, everything that is God's will. Now think about this. His name means lovely. And we talked about that in another show. Mm -hmm. But think about this now. Wrestling. You get entangled with a wrestler. You fight. You wrestle until you win or you, you lose. The whole concept of the Shema is that we are entangled in God. His word entangles us so that we cannot escape, so that we are his love slaves. There's a song that my, my daughter used to sing when she was, what, three years old? What was the, how, how did it go? Wrapped up, what is it? Wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in Jesus. Right. Say it again. She used to say, wrapped up, ta wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in Jesus. And that's what she used to say. Well, she looked at herself in the mirror, of course. And <laughs> when you put that prayer short, now people say, I don't need a prayer short. No, you don't, no. No, in the New Testament, no. But understand this, that those who want to put a prayer short on do not discriminate that because it is still a prayer short. And if people feel and their sense in their heart that it locks them in, it moves them away, then by all means, you can do that in your private time. It is no condemnation and it is still honored by God. But if you don't do that, make sure you got a prayer short over your heart. And over your mind that you still disconnect yourself. When you are in prayer with God, you do not let anything take you away from that. And I remember quickly a story. It was about um, Charles Spurgeon, great preacher. And um, he told his uh, servant, I'm going to go into prayer because he used to have his time of prayer. I don't want to be disturbed. And at one time, this man came to the door, knocked on the door and, to and told the servant, go, um, you know, tell Mr. Spurgeon that so-and-so is here. And she said, he is praying, and he doesn't like to be disturbed. And she's, he said, it is a matter, it is a matter, it is urgency, you know, it's a matter of importance. So she carefully went and knocked on the door, and he told her, I, I told you not to disturb me, I am praying. So she went back, and she told the man what he said, and he got indignant. He said, tell Mr. Spurgeon that I am here. She goes back, and he told her the same thing. He said, Tell him that I am in prayer. So she goes back and she tells him, and he got very much more indignant. He said, tell Mr. Spurgeon that the servant of the Lord is here and I want to speak to him. She went back and told him, the servant of the Lord, he said, is here. He wants to speak to you. And he said, you tell the servant of the Lord <laughs> that I'm talking, I'm speaking with his master. And when I finish speaking with his master, I will speak to his servant. Well, that was that. Let's talk about something exciting that happened in the New Testament. There was a woman that bled chronically. She hemorrhaged. And she was sick. She bled for 12 years, the Bible says. And it tells us that the more doctors she went to, the worse she became. Imagine that, going to every doctor. And the more she went to the doctors, the worse she became. So the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 9, verse 20, it tells us this. Behold, a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years came behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said within herself, if I just touch his garment, I will be made well. But Jesus, now something happened, this is in between, but Jesus turning around and seeing her said, daughter, cheer up, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Now, these verses here, in other words, something happens in between. And we know the story when you look at other stories. 
But understand that this Jewish woman knew the importance of the tassels upon the blue ribbon placed at the bottom of the robe that the high priests or the priests and even rabbis wore. She understood that very well. And although there were many men in Jerusalem that wore the tassels of prayer, she knew that Jesus was not an ordinary man, that he had power and authority to release healing for her sickness. Now, some people had questioned, did Jesus wear a prayer shawl? Well, what do you think? He was Jewish, number one. And you had to wear a prayer shawl whenever you stood before the people and prayed. Or even you spoke. So this is pretty much what it would look like when he stood and he went into the synagogue in Matthew and in Luke. But pretty much what they look like today. We see that men today still wear the frontlets upon their heads, which, by the way, these little boxes on top of the head have the scriptures that we've been reading, Deuteronomy, Numbers. It's in there. And do you know, they have a person that takes care of them, a scholar, a person, his course of far, a person who writes these, um, the scriptures in these little kosher, kosher skins that are pure. In other words, the animal has to be raised very, very carefully. And then when it is slaughtered properly, they take the skin and then they work it. And then they write the Torah on these skins. So these, in the boxes, you have little pieces of, of scrolls with the scriptures written and then it's locked and they put it on top of their forehead between the eyes because God told them to do that. And so you see they have prayer shawls and they have, you notice in their arms, they have the leather belt wrapped around their arm. And usually it's on the left. They say sometimes on the right, but usually it's on the left arm because that's the arm that's closest to the heart. That's where it's at. Left. And it's important because if we don't see it from this point of view, we will miss the whole point of the word of God wrapped properly around our arms, wrapped properly around our hand. Now, notice that she said to herself, she must have, watch this, she said to herself, so in other words, she must have recited the Shema being a Jew this was the morning ritual prayer. She had to do that. Even though she had this sickness, women today still do that. And she remembered the promises of God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Very important to understand. Now, we're going to go a little bit over today, but I want you to understand this. Very important. She knew the promises of God. She knew what the word says. She knew about her redemption coming out of Egypt because that's what he said. Remember, I have taken you up out of Egypt and into the promised land and that God would protect her and keep her. She knew that. And she would not let her circumstances keep her from seeking the God that could heal her. And that's important. That, you know, the Shema, your prayers in the morning is so important when you're wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in Jesus. <laughs> This is where you receive the blessing as you recite the word of God and pray. It was not just bobbing back and forth, but concentrated prayer, meditative prayer with the word of God. And she pressed through the crowd and reached out her hand to touch the tassels on the blue ribbon that represents the word and the name of God. Now think about this. She pressed through the crowd. I mean, she was unclean. But she didn't care about what people thought. She Listen, she was only concerned for one thing. She wanted to touch the tassels of the master. And as you see, she did. And as soon as, as, soon as she touched it, the Bible tells us that she felt in herself that she was healed. And Jesus turns around with the pressing of the crowd, says, who touched me? And one of the disciples said, uh, you know, Rabbi, Master, um, you got all these people around pressing on you. He says, no, someone touched me. Way beyond just pressing on me, someone reached into me. Are you listening? True faith reaches into Christ. True prayer reaches into Christ. And she took a hold. She said, I know where the law is. 
I know what the fringes represent. And I know that if I touch this man's fringes, if I touch the tassels, the little bells that represent the law, I know that something is going to happen. Her faith was in the word of God, but she saw the Messiah. She saw him. She said, there's something different about him. And the power was released from the Savior into her body and stopped the bleeding of her sickness that she had for 12 years, 12 representing a complete number. She was completely sick, but now she was completely made whole. Jesus proclaimed to her, daughter of Abraham. So when she turned around, listen, when he turned around and said, who touched me? The Bible says that she gave a testimony of right there. And he heard her testimony. They heard it. And when she spoke the testimony, he said, Daughter of Abraham, your faith has made you whole. In other words, not only did she feel and sense that her her bleeding had stopped, but her faith and her prayer gave testimony to what happened in between her pressing in and taking hold of the master's tassels and speaking to the crowd what happened. Mm. The Bible tells us that we overcame him, Satan, and sickness by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Every time, listen to this. I want to share something. We're almost closing. Every time we sin, we forget the virtue of our spiritual formation. The very image of God and the purpose for which God has created us. That's why the Shema is very important when you pray. You are to Shema every moment. Listen, when sin enters into your mind, Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, your soul, your strength. Jesus said this. So every time sin knocks on the door, shamar. Because every time you do so, sin will have to lose its power, its grip. If the enemy can cause us to forget what God has spoken, watch this, deception, he can get us to accept the lie and bring into mind so that we negate the word of God. He brings deception into the mind. But this is the word that comes to us by the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts 17, 28. It is by faith that we live and move and have our being. Do this in remembrance, Jesus said. What is it? The very table of remembrance. The atonement sacrifice of Christ is the most important day for the Christian, and we must never forget. We must remember him at the communion table and give him glory, honor, and praise. This is, remember, at the very day of the atonement, the most important day of the year, they were to sit and have dinner, and Jesus sits and have dinner with the disciples, and he takes bread, and he takes wine. He says, this is my body that is broken for all of you. Notice broken in two. The two becoming one bread, the one God. And then he takes the, and he says, eat eat of it all, or eat all of it. And he says, this is the wine of my blood, the New Testament. Drink it. So Christ is the way of our service and worship. He is the truth for the heart to praise, and he is the way for prayers to reach the very heart of the Father. Think about this now. You are called to that communion table. I don't think it's just once a month when we have it at church. That's okay. But communion, listen, the communion table is every day. And every time you pray, you're at the communion table with Christ. And you can eat of him and you can drink of him and you can have fellowship with him. And listen, he is your prayer, Shaw. And he wraps you in the fringe of his word. And he touches you that you may hear the tassels, the bells ring in your spirit as you spend time with him. Oh, we can go on. God bless you. Have a wonderful spirit-filled day. And remember, Christ in you is the hope of glory. And as my wife just said, please don't forget.